Welcome to Speak for Yourself. I'm Jason Whitlock. That's Marcellus Wiley, that no, dude. No. Coming up, we'll tell you why everyone hates Chris Paul. Stop that. <laughs> and I've got another installment of That Dude's Dudes. Yes, Emmy winning That Dude's Dudes. <laughs> but we start every day with a Whitlock. What you got today, big dog? Uh, what we're witnessing in the NFL this season is orchestrated genius courtesy of my main man, Jerry Jones. That's my dog. The Cowboys owner is the reason the league is reestablishing its dominance in television ratings and water cooler conversation. Jerry Jones is the reason the current NFL season feels like the Madden video game in franchise mode. The Raiders and the Giants, historic franchises, are tanking. The Cowboys and the Saints have made bold trades to improve their teams. The Steelers and the Patriots have entered the Patrick Peterson sweepstakes. The NFL trade deadline is the day before Halloween, and everyone is already anticipating <coughs> all sorts of tricks and treats. Toss in the emergence of superstar quarterback Patrick Mahomes, the incredible uptick in scoring, the disappearance of kneeling talk, and even the league's harshest critics have to admit the NFL is on and popping. Before I continue, I have to tip my hat to Mark Slareth for helping me realize what's going on here. Yesterday, Stink said something very profound. We're servicing the fan base that we've cultivated. That's what the league is doing right now. We have cultivated, it's not old school fans anymore. It's people that grew up on fantasy football, fantasy basketball. Mm. So all we're doing is servicing that fantasy crowd that we've created. It mirrors, the game is mirroring what we're, what we're watching and what we're doing on the internet. Yep, the NFL is aggressively leaning into fantasy football which is gambling and video games. <clears throat> Faced with a ratings and Trump trolling crisis last season, the NFL has responded with a product that scores more points and produces more headlines by taking bold risk. The forces that want to turn the NFL into a political discussion are being drowned out by the football fans who want to talk about Amari Cooper's impact on Dak Prescott, whether the Raiders and the Giants are smart for tanking, and whether the Steelers would be Super Bowl favorites with Patrick Peterson. The old stodgy NFL is finding a way to let its hair down without betraying its brand. I credit the tantrum Jones threw last year over Commissioner Roger Goodell's new contract. The extended feud between Jones and Goodell will be looked upon as one of the great moments in league history, a turning point in the revitalization of the NFL. You can't fry bacon without a fire. Jerry lit the fire by taking on Goodell, Falcons owner Arthur Blank, and any other owner satisfied with the status quo. From the outset, it looked like Jerry, from the outside, it looked like Jerry lost the war with Goodell. Jerry didn't lose. The NFL won. The league has moved beyond its complacency. This reminds me of The Godfather 1 when Peter Clemenza explained to Michael Corleone, these things got to happen every five to ten years. Helps get rid of the bad blood. I believe the tanking, the bold trades, the officiating tweaks that have made scoring easier are all a part of a genius plan to help the NFL recover from last season. All right, joining the desk now is Fox NFL analyst Mark Slareth and Yahoo Sports uh, writer Chris Haynes. Marcellus, I'll start with you. I'm giving Jerry a lot of love here. I think the NFL's offensive explosion, I, you've converted me on that. Oh. I think it's actually a good oh. thing. <laughs> I think the, I just think things are all pieces and cream in the NFL. Oh, welcome, Whitlock. <laughs> <laughs> We've been expecting you. I mean, I'm here. It, it, it is genius. Um, the NFL has the millennial mindset where we're going to work smarter, not harder. Why go up that hill and try to go out there and appease all the purists like a Jason Whitlock? If the heads don't roll on the 50-yard line, it's not real football. I ain't going nowhere, regardless. <laughs> You're not going anywhere, regardless. <laughs> I love it. And I think there's two layers beyond the genius statement by Mark Schlereff of how this game is evolving. One, second-generation athletes. And we're seeing it happen in all sports and even in NFL. Why is that important? Uh, a doctor always says you can't out-train DNA. Uh, my mother was 6'1", 250. Ooh. I was coming. Something, I, it, was a, it, it took a while. I was a late bloomer, but, brother, I was coming. So little Johnny was working hard, and he had a little leg up, and he was better than me in high school. Oh, but I had to catch up to mama and then pass her, and I was coming. So you got to respect second-generation athletes want their kids to be involved with the sport of football, 
but not the brutality necessarily. And second of all, the civilized minds who love football. Soccer moms, soccer dads, just a normal citizen who's like, I want my son to go out there and play flag football and transition to the sport of football, but all the issues that come with it, can you please address that NFL? And I think right now, by making this a softer league, as Whitlock always professes, it's actually going to help not only the fantasy sports, yeah. the scoring opportunities, but it's going to make it more civilized for all of us to embrace. I think the one thing you have to understand in any business, when you're dealing with a business, and I have a food business, is you can't satisfy everybody. Hmm. And there's some people that you'll never satisfy. And you know what? That's okay. Like this business that we're in, hey, if 50% of the people love you and 50% of the people hate you, that's all right. Yeah. I'm going to service the majority of my clientele. And the only people that I ever heard have a real issue with the NFL and said, we're not watching anymore, is older, hardcore NFL <laughs> fans. Like, I have a problem with the kneeling, and I won't do it. You know, it's an – and you know what the NFL has said? Okay, we'll see you guys around sometime because bottom line is you're tailing off anyhow, mm -hmm. and we've got a younger generation of football fan that we're going to service. That, that's what we're going to cultivate. That's what we're going to grow. And you know what? That group is far they're, – they're coming into their earning potential – they're coming into, to, you know, they're they're growing up watching this and, and they're evolving with our sport and we are going to service that client. And if we lose, for every one we lose, we're going to gain three on this side. And we're okay with that equation because that ultimately means we're making money. And that's the, one thing about the owners, and <laughs> you cannot, I mean, one thing about them, <laughs> those dudes know how to make money. Yes, they do. Uh, no doubt. And listening to you, Jason, I, I think it was well, well said. And listening to you, this is what I got it from it. The NFL for years, for the most part, they made their money. Their bread and butter was the on-field product. Watch, come out on Sundays, watch the game, we make our money. That's why we get our popularity, our notoriety. The NBA has kind of transitioned from that to where I have a lot of executives who are a lot of older guys who criticize the, the, the writers in our profession nowadays saying, you guys don't cover the games too much. All you guys do is, is write about what somebody said, the personalities, the transactions. That's what everybody wants to know about. That, the NBA has personalities, characters, and I think that's what Jerry Jones is doing right there, adding a personality, adding an outspoken individual who's going to say something. The fuse, the drama, that's what the diehard sports fans of this era, that's what they want to hear about. If I want to write a story about what happened in the second, third quarter of a game, they, they can see that online somewhere. They don't care about that. It's the transaction, it's the buzz, the outspokenness, and I think that's what, the, that's what Jerry Jones is doing. You make a point that I actually thought about this morning when I was contemplating this in terms of, I, I was irritated, Lil Wayne sitting next to I'm Odell I'm Beckham Jr. Yeah. And, and then I was just like, and, and I said, John Marr somewhat irritated by the things Odell Beckham said. But at the end of the day, it's just feeding mm -hmm. the animals. It's just feeding, feeding the narrative the yeah. and the headlines and the conversation. And kids, Little Wayne fans that may not be the biggest football fans, are introduced to Odell Beckham Jr. and taking interest yeah. in football. I, I really do. And, and the, my point overall here is just like sometimes you need a big fight to galvanize mm -hmm. and to provoke change and to get people to take things seriously. And Roger Goodell and Jerry Jones had a big fight, and I think it's been healthy for the NFL, and they're coming out on the other side of it with a better product that I don't think betrays their brand, but puts them in position to captivate, uh, to capitalize on where we are right now with sports fans. Yeah, uh, look, sports is best sold through storyline. Let's just be real. Uh, it could be a great fight. Two undefeated guys going at it, uh, and I'm watching it without the same vested interest if I knew those individuals, if I knew their stories, if I, you know, that's why there's a 24-7 access that's leading up to a big fight. And that's when you know someone who can sell their own fight. I'm all in on that. Even if he's not of the same caliber of someone else who's out there who's anonymous. So that's the NFL's new business model, and I love it. You see Jerry Jones clashing with Roger Goodell. I think Jerry Jones, he won this. He galvanized the NFL, but it was unintended consequences. Uh, I don't think that he came out there with a direction of coming at Goodell for these after effects. What happened was simply, you're messing with my pockets. You know, hey, hey Roger Goodell, you suspended Ezekiel Elliott, you're messing with my money. 
there's principalities to this, Smokey. And he looking at Roger Goodell like, <laughs> you can't be stirring up the pot, and it's now affecting me, one of your best ambassadors in terms of growing this game. So, yeah, this is the result, but this wasn't the intention. Yeah, he, there's no question that he has been a visionary. It's why he's in the Hall of Fame. He's been a visionary when it comes to marketing this game, when it comes to putting this game on television. His deal with Fox, when he created his deal with the NFL and Fox, Fox was only in 60% of the households in America. Like, like every other owner was like, are you crazy? We can't do this. But he has been a visionary in that regard. And once again, he has seen, he has seen what has gone on here. And the NFL has adopted it. But he has seen where the next generation of fans are to make this a $20 billion a year business. Yeah. And that's where they're going. Yeah. All right, I, I, I want to end on this note and ask you all's opinions. The anthem controversy galvanized and made the NFL have this scrap. Have we moved to such a healthy place where you can see a day this year or next year where Colin Kaepernick is back in the NFL? No. Um, uh, and it's not merit-based. And I don't think the positions on every roster, the 53 men on every roster, was ever merit-based. So pre-Colin Kaepernick, we used to look in the locker room and say, why is he starting? And why is he on this team? Right. And, you know, we've always had that. And it, it, it's political at times. It's marketing. It, it's, it's community involvement. It's contract terms. It, there's always so much going into the equation of who's on your team. Well, Colin Kaepernick right now, one, suing the NFL, uh, obviously puts him in a different position. Eric Reed is doing the same thing, but Colin Kaepernick has more stance, has more of a platform than Eric Reed. Two, uh, I just don't think that an owner is going to stick out from the group of owners and say, I'm the guy that can take that. Should he? Yes. Will he? No. I have to agree with you. Just like you said, the anthem talk is quieted down. Owners probably feel like there's no reason to, to start this up again. And you got, it takes that one owner, to, like you said, to stick out from the group and take a stand. I don't see that happening. Yeah, I, yeah go ahead. I got a different take. I don't think Colin Kaepernick wants to play football anymore. Oh, that's why you said that before. Yeah, why not? He's still working out. He was been given opportunities. Yeah, I think that's all. Of, oh. That's all smokescreen. Hmm. I I don't know. Like once the lawsuit is settled, and if he does want to play, I think there may be an opportunity. The one thing I know about the NFL is if, regardless of the position you play, like if your if your talent trumps the noise that follows you, you're getting a job. Yeah. But if the noise that follows you is louder than the talent, guess what? You're unemployed. Mm -hmm. Ray Rice still had enough talent to play in this game. Nobody gave him an opportunity. Why? Because the noise trumped the talent. And when the noise trumps the talent, guess what? You're unemployed. You no longer get to work. This is the Speak for Yourself podcast. I'm Jason Whitlock. And before the show moves along, I want to tell you today's show is brought to you by Zip Recruiter. Are you hiring, posting your position to job sites and waiting and waiting for the right people to see it? Zip Recruiter knew there was a smarter way, so they built a platform that finds the right job candidates for you. Zip Recruiter learns what you're looking for, identifies people with the right experience, and invites them to apply to your job. These invitations have revolutionized how you find your next hire. In fact, 80% of employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. And ZipRecruiter doesn't stop there. They even spotlight the strongest applications you receive so you never miss a great match. The right candidates are out there. ZipRecruiter is how you find them. Businesses of all size trust ZipRecruiter for their hiring needs. Right now, my listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash speak. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash speak. ZipRecruiter.com slash S-P-E-A-K. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Now back to the show. All right, welcome back. I'm Jason Whitlock. That's Marcellus Wiley. Mark Slareth is back. Yeah. Joining us now is Steelers legend James Harrison. You all know Marcellus is that dude. Now he's going to show us the best plays from big guys from around football. It's time for That Dude's Dudes. Marcellus, what you got? This side of the desk couldn't block this side of the desk. <laughs> Just want to let y'all know that right now. Let's talk about the big <laughs> uglies. And let's start off That Dude's Dudes with number three. We're going to high school, y'all. The Hunt School, Princeton, New Jersey. 
Watch this offensive lineman, Caden Wallace, Ooh. with his Nittany Lionheart. Oh, heart. oh, uh, oh. This yeah. is a Penn State recruit. Look at that Mark Slayer, Ooh. young Mark Slayer out oh, there. Boy. First things first. Hey, defensive end, you're not running track. You're playing football. This looks like a run stance from the offensive oh. lineman. Oh, you got <laughs> stood up. In this moment, you can't be straight up, because you guess what you're going to happen? You're going to go straight down. Fat Joe, tell him what's up. <laughs> <laughs> and you about to lead back to the tune of 10 yards oh. through my man for a first down. Now, look at him right there in that track stance. Getting pushed, getting pushed. Now he's thinking about it. Okay, I should get up, but... Oh, wait a minute. I, uh, wait, wait a minute. I should no, get no. back, but you know what? Back in the day, you speared him right there. Yeah! <laughs> it fell. No. So, uh, Debo, tell me what's up. Anybody else? <laughs> Kate <laughs> wow. Wallace, leave him alone, man. You wow. are third. That dude of the week. Now let's go to the collegiate level. Number two, Rutgers defense alignment, Willington Prevalon. Say good night, like night night. You can see him get the sack. Right now, two tackles, one sack, and Rutgers still lost to Northwestern 18-15. Let's see how this went down. First things, first inside hand position. Uh-oh, you got him right there. So now if you look at him, He's going to go with the inside hand. Oh, he got that elbow, Mark. You know what happens, Jason. Mm -hmm. You know what happens when you get that Ooh, elbow. That and he actually repositioned the arm. That's what coaches always teach us. Don't just leave it up in the air. Get it on him. Now you got him leaning. It's time to hit him with the cape. It's time to hit him with the Ole. Look at that leverage you got on him. All you got to do is throw him. Oh, yeah. Throw him to the way he wants to go. And now get the sack on the quarterback. Number two, Willington Prevalon, our dat dude of the week. But let's go to the pro level. Number one. Buccaneers defensive end Carl Nassib, the wolf of Wall Street. Y'all remember this dude, right? Giving stock tips to all his teammates back in the days. Well, guess what? He's out there now giving sack tips to everybody. I see you, Carl. First thing he does is he gets his revenge. Two sacks on Baker Mayfield. Sits him down. Desmond Harrison, you got sat down in that position. Now you're going to oh, hit him God. with the collegiate move. Damn, the arm over Silky Swim. And that is the most important part of this move. Not only turning your hips, but clearing them with your arm to make sure that he can't come back and drive you past the quarterback. And look at this right here, this log ride. Look at this jam right here. Three guys on the log ride. <laughs> yeah, baby. But Baker ain't happy. He the one that got to go down and get wet in this situation. But, hey, great technique, Carl Nassib. You're our dad dude of the week. Oh, that was like, good. Looked like that video game centipede right there. With <laughs> those, those three guys on each other. <laughs> you did. All right, let's move to some big stories. Starting in Pittsburgh, where the Steelers are still waiting for Le'Veon Bell to show up, but could be trying to add another All-Pro, Cardinals cornerback Patrick Peterson, who last week made it clear he wants out of Arizona. Peterson tried to backtrack from his comments today, but, but Antonio Brown is still openly recruiting him posting on Instagram, quote, automatic chip with P2 to the Steelers. Uh, I'm not sure <laughs> if I... It, it, the question here is, who should the Steelers want more? Yeah. Patrick Peterson or Le'Veon Bell? And I would have to say Patrick Peterson would be more valuable to the Steelers than Le'Veon Bell. They need defensive help. James Conner seems to be a capable running back. They've made it this far without uh, Le'Veon Bell. If they could add something to their defense, they might be right there with the Chiefs and the Patriots as an uh, AFC contender for the Super Bowl. Uh, I'm going Le'Veon Bell, but I respect your hesitation because if you look at uh, their rankings in terms of rushing, they're 26, despite James Conner being good. And then you look at the pass defense, it's 27th. So both sides need help, need that infusion of a great player, but... Uh, if you look at it, I'm going to let the NFL tip the scales. And the NFL right now in this soft league, in this league that is out there accenting offensive production and scoring, uh, I'm going to go where the NFL is going, and that is to the offensive player into that position. Le'Veon Bell is special. Patrick Peterson is special. But Le'Veon Bell affects more than just the running back position. He affects the wide receiving position. And you look at the wide receivers who all of a sudden feel his presence and then he slots in there as the number two, number three guy. It opens it up for everyone else. Antonio Brown is not on pace of his normal standard in part. No Le'Veon Bell. I I'm going to disagree with you. I'm going to go with Jason on this because I believe Pat will bring exactly what they need. Mm. The Steelers are 27th in defense, but at that same time, I believe they're like third in sacks. So they're getting to the quarterback. They need someone back there to be able to hold up a little bit longer, and Patrick Peterson can do that. Bringing Le'Veon back... 
I don't think Le'Veon is going to give them exactly what they think they're going to get or what he's capable of because he mm. has a possibility of going out there, playing in a game, getting hurt, and losing what he could potentially have of a $40 million guarantee just to get $800,000. Um, I don't... I don't, and they don't see him being there after this year. You don't think Patrick Peterson could get hurt? I mean, he could get hurt, get hurt but yeah. they don't. Le'Veon after. is not going to be there after after this year. And like he Good said, point. that point He's, of the effort, like yeah. for for me personally, I'm not going to go out there and give you what you think you're going to get, and you haven't given me the security that I need. Well said from a former Steelers defensive player. But if you look at it on the other side of the ball, uh, you need to score points in today's NFL. Let's go to the Super Bowl. If I got somebody that can stop you. Uh, no, 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 no. I'm going to prove your about? point wrong. I'm sorry, go Jason. Ahead. Should I get some distance first? Because I go want ahead. this to go off smoothly. <laughs> um, 41-33 was the Super Bowl, right? Mm -hmm. And the team that won, Philadelphia Eagles, had a top four defense. And guess what? They won, but they gave up 33. The highest they scoring... They against one of the coldest quarterbacks they ever played coldest a game. Coldest quarterbacks, but not coldest offense. Uh, the top scoring offense last year was the Rams at 30 points a game. My Tom point Brady is... makes up for a lot. Oh, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. But the top offense scores 30. And if you give up 33, you're still in a dog fight. if we fight. had some defense, we played a little <laughs> better defense, stopped somebody on a couple third downs, then we would have got out of there with a win. That is the old era of thinking. Defense wins championship. Man, I boys. didn't say defense win. I didn't holler that. Okay. Listen, you're going to have to stop somebody. Who's the best team right now? Who do you think the best team Rams. is right now? The Rams. Why? Because they have it on every level. What about the defense? defense they got a defense that they can do. stop somebody. They do. But Why wouldn't you say Kansas City? Because Kansas City is... Don't have a defense, huh? Wait a minute. <laughs> Kansas City don't have a defense, Wait a minute. Huh? Kansas City don't have a defense. They lost, but they still scored, what, 40-something points? Yeah, yeah exactly. And it that's don't matter. They don't have it. a defense. They're the worst defense, and the worst defense lost that game. I'm moving on, because I'm out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm moving on. What are we talking about? I ain't about? been in the weight room enough. Yeah. <laughs> here, here would be here would be my only concern with bringing Patrick Peterson to the Steelers. Now, you played for both New England and you played for the Steelers, and New England and Tom Brady seem to have that number. There are certain teams that I played against during the course of my career where they just seem to have, like, they matched up well against us. My question would be, Patrick Peterson has been consistently a man corner. That's what he has run. That's what he's made his name on. He is playing on a lot of zone concepts now in Arizona with Steve Wilkes, and it hasn't been the same for Patrick Peterson. Mm. When you go to the Steelers, are you going to match up and give him that man principle scheme that he can run? Or the Steelers you... want to run man. Right. I and know so, that. Okay. If, yeah, but they ha they haven't against or they haven't been efficient mm -hmm. in doing that. Um, and and so can you can you change that system? Can you put that in? Can you have Patrick Peterson run that? Because if you can do that, then it's Patrick Peterson all day. But if you ask him to play zone corner um, in, in the scheme that you currently run, you know, that that to me is a bad fit. They're not going to bring Pat in there and tell him run run zone. They're not going to do that. They're going to they're going to go and try and sit him on the best receiver that they have, mm -hmm. follow him around and lock down that side, that player, whatever it may right. be. They're not going to bring him in so, here and say, let's play uh, like, cover two. Right. If, so if that's, if that's the case, if that's what you're going to do, then I would say Patrick Peterson would be more beneficial to the Steelers if that was the case than Le'Veon Bell. Well, nah, I, I always, I always I, have to look I, I, at... Have we forgotten what Le'Veon Bell has done for this offense? Have we forgotten, since he's not there, we're prisoners of the moment, that this team last year, despite all of his issues, was 13-3? and three. This is a team that can go out there and do different things offensively right. if you get him. I, Patrick Peterson just solidifies the right. defense. Trump card, my, but my, Trump yeah, card? my, wor my the worry world, is everyone's this. Scoring. I'm always looking, I'm always looking at like I, the, the Steelers are going to be fine. The Steelers will probably win their division. The Steelers, you know, my thing is how do you beat New England? Because that's your path. You better score. That's they your score path. 38, but you have, you, 38 points England, you the last to, four you have games. To play, you, have to play, you have to play man. You have to bump and, dis, and, and disturb the timing of the routes of the receivers and everything else. And when we went up there a couple years ago, we couldn't do that. We, yeah. we, didn't, have the, we didn't have the ability to play man. How do, how do we the, started how do playing zone Broncos, and he tore us apart. Right. How did the Denver Broncos beat them in 2015 in the, in the uh, AFC Championship, AFC Divisional game? I mean, they, they lined up in press, man, and they beat those guys up off the line of scrimmage, mm -hmm. and they let those pass rushers get to Tom Brady, and Tom Brady had a, you know, a very average, below average game. I just feel like James played the trump card in terms of 
you don't know what kind of effort you're going to get from Le'Veon Bell. He's set mm -hmm. out half the season already. He knows he's not going to be there. His primary motivation is getting that contract more than being the best stealer possible. I think that could affect his effort. I agree with James. Best defense nowadays is a great offense. That's just the way the game's going. We'll see again. It's going to be high scoring. All right, to another big Pittsburgh story. With Ben Roethlisberger coming to the defense of Derek Carr, after a report yesterday said Carr's crying on the field was aggravating tensions in the Raiders' locker room. Carr denied he cried on the field, but Big Ben said even if he did, it's no big deal. Well, I think as, as men in general, we all need to show emotion. I think there's a, a miscon misconception out there that as men we shouldn't show emotion, and I think that's wrong. I think we need to show emotion, whether it's in a movie, if you want to cry, if it's funny, if it's sad, if you want to be around your wife or girlfriend, and, um, you know, it's... It, just because you cry doesn't mean you're any less manly. I think that's that's a false narrative. And, and so when it comes to football, if something hurts, I mean, he might have been hurting. Who knows? Um, I know I've cried in the locker room before uh, for both joy and pain. Um, you lose a football game, you know, if, if you're not showing emotion, if he's or if he gets up from something like that and he's laughing, then he's going to get chastised for not showing enough emotion. So um, I don't know exactly the story you're talking about, but for me, um, I don't think it makes us any less manly. This is, story has kind of confused me because I just never thought crying on a football field, a locker room, before a game, after a game, you get hurt, lose, whatever. I just never thought it was a big deal. I, I've seen guys right. cry. Right. Uh, I, I've seen guys show that kind of emotion. I can remember as a kid, you know, I cried. I, I couldn't play in a game because I was hurt. Uh, but I've definitely seen guys cry after losses or after a disappointing performance. Mm -hmm. Hell, I still cry about the way I played against Western Michigan in 1988. <laughs> uh, so I, I just don't see this as a, I, I don't see why Derek Carr would be taking any heat. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, someone we know uh, very well, and, and Marty Schottenheimer used to cry twice a week. Yeah. Uh, and we'd be like, all right, you <laughs> cried on Wednesday, coach. It's Sunday now. You got to, you know, pick one. Um, I, I used to cry a lot. Uh, tears of joy in the beginning of the season. We're 0-0. The Jets fly over. I'm like, man, we could do it this year. And then we lose that game, and then I realized, all right, next year. Um, <laughs> uh, Dick Vermeil used to cry. Ray a Lewis lot. was out there crying. Uh, you look at a lot of guys that we... Luke Keekley, I remember when he got hurt. Remember Luke Keekley was out there mm -hmm. just crying? Man, uh, guys, when they put the towel over their head, every time they put a the towel over their head, it's not yes. to get more air. It's because you try to, to yeah, hold it I, in. I played with you know, the guy we called the ultimate cryer. He gonna hate me for this, but Heinz Ward. Listen, Heinz would cry about anything, mm. you know? And, uh, you know, that's just the way he was. That's how he showed his emotions. Um, you know, he didn't have a problem with doing that. Um, so I don't, I don't have an issue with him crying. If, even if he was crying, you know, some things hurt. Uh, it may be that much pain that you need to uh, shed a tear. But I, in that certain situation, I didn't see it. I didn't see it to you. You know what? Here's the here's the deal, and I don't even think it's about I don't think it's about pain. I think it's about uh, emotional. I, you know, like I I always kid with my with my kids. I mean, I got emotional incontinence. I will at a, at a movie. I mean, I will cry <laughs> like a baby. <laughs> it's just the way I'm wired. Um, and so I just am, I'm emotional that way. Never cried necessarily on a football field from pain. But sure, when you start, to, when you get hurt, and all of a sudden your season is over. Yes. The the emotion of that, and you know, I mean, how much work you've put in, how much off season preparation. Think about this. A couple of years ago, he broke his leg. He knew his season was over. If he went down in that sack and thought he broke his arm, and I've been there where I thought I broke something, and it turned out to be a high ankle sprain or something, but it oh, yeah. felt like I broke something. Like you think your season's over? That's a, it, it's emotional. We're so invested in each other. We're so invested in the season. And I know this from spending a lot of time being injured. When you're not part of it, man, you feel like a pariah. Yeah. You come in, you go to the, the training room, you get tra everybody else goes to meetings, and you don't feel like part of that. That's emotionally, when it, when you, when it strikes you and you're sitting on the field going, this might be it for me, like, that is, it is so hard to deal with. So if you cry about it, and like, I, I don't have an issue with that. Talk about that mountain that we have to climb up. And, and football is the most fickle sport of all. How many times have you walked into training camp or seen that guy, six-pack, been eating right, got all his rest, did all his workouts, and go right. out there, season over. Pop his ACL, right? Pop, right. See you next yeah. season, right? right and all of there. that rushes in, man, all that pain, all that emotion, not just the work you put in, but the work you got to put back in mm -hmm. just to get back to this place. Not improve, not be better, right. just to get back to this square one. Every NFL player, and again, this doesn't apply to Derek Carr because he got his big contract, but even when you're a special teams guy and you're young, you're 23, 24, 
you're always thinking at some point, I'm going to make it big in the NFL and I'm going to get that big contract. And then you get hurt and all that just goes through your mind about, damn, hmm. what I was going to do for mama and them when I got <laughs> that contract yeah, yeah, right. and all that. It all hits you at the same time. And that's like Earl Thomas, who's already made a bunch of money. But when he got hurt, when he knows he's going into, look, out more money and a new place to play and all that other stuff, the emotions overtake you. So I look at this story that's being put out there for a reason. Why did someone put this story out there that the players are upset because he's crying? And it's like they're trying to build a narrative that Derek Carr doesn't fit with the Raiders. And, and I heard Cowherd, I think, talking about this earlier on his show. And it's like they're... they're basing him up or preparing him to be trade bait. To me, yeah, yeah. is what it sounds like. They're putting out a story like he doesn't fit here, and, and so, this story just doesn't add up. Who cares if he cried? I may cry after this show. All right, welcome back. Whitlock and Wiley here. We got an incredible game one of the World Series last night, and we're joined now by Fox MLB analyst Nick Swisher. Nick, it seems like it's same question every time. <laughs> every year. Yeah, it's, it's postseason. Just, and I, I'm almost even wondering about Clayton Kershaw. Right. Is it even fair that we keep having this same discussion up and down? Is every great pitcher incredible in the postseason? Not everybody. Yeah. You know, I, I think that, you know, we, we sometimes forget what he has accomplished in the regular season. I think we look at a small sample size of what he does when the lights are the brightest, when the, when the non-baseball fans come over and actually watch the game of baseball. Uh, but everybody knows about his struggles that he's gone through. He's had a good start. He has a bad start. He has a good start. He has a bad start. Comes in out of the bullpen, does a pretty good job. Um, but I think if you're the Los Angeles Dodgers and you look at the big picture of this World Series, if you can't count on Clayton Kershaw, hmm. who can you count on? Yeah. I feel like, you know, the rest of the guys coming in, you got Ryu today, you know, you got uh, Walker Bueller, who's a tremendous young arm. But if you can't count on the face of your franchise to go out and win you a game when you need it, how good do you feel like your chances are? Uh, coldest game of the year for the Dodgers, certainly. <laughs> yeah. um, you saw it was nippy. Out <laughs> yeah. uh, See everybody's breath? Yeah, man. Yep. I mean, the effect on Clayton Kershaw, the effect on the ball and his pitching performance, uh, do you give him a pass? And talk about those conditions. Yeah, you know, I, I think... Um, you know, you don't want to make excuses for anybody. Uh, and I think everybody had the same exact ballpark, the same yeah. exact thing they were, they, they were playing. So uh, I think with Clayton, I think Boston's got a great approach. I think they've got a great game plan with him. If you watch the game last night real closely, there were a lot of extremely close pitches right there on the corner of the zone that the Boston Red Sox were laying off of. You know, Clayton did a pretty good job. He didn't let up two of those runs of his. But still, at the end of the day, when you look at his line, it didn't look impressive. All right, despite the loss from your ace, how confident should the Dodgers feel in that loss? Yeah, I still feel like they got a chance, you know? I mean, in, in my opinion, I hope this thing goes seven games. I'm sure for Fox, we all want this thing to Say go it, seven absolutely. games, you know? E e e We're company men, you know? <laughs> so I, I think in general, I, I think the one thing the, the Los Angeles Dodgers need to do is to get back to the game that they know how, right? Last night, they went with an all right-handed lineup. The first time that's ever been done in World Series play. Play. For me, I need my man Cody Bellinger back in the lineup. He was the NLCS MVP. You got to have that swag. He can give it to you offensively. He can give it to you defensively on the infield and in the outfield. David Price, mm -hmm. $200 million. Yeah. <laughs> give me that money. He's been up and down. What should we expect from him tonight? Yeah, I, I, you know, I think people sometimes forget the um, – kind of the mashups that David Price has had with the Boston media, you know, with Dennis Eckersley, you know, everything that they've gone through. It hasn't exactly been a smooth ride for him. Um, but I think that something happened to him. When he was in the bullpen, right, and he was warming up game four in Houston, right, he said he felt something, right? Something started working for him. All of a sudden, the things that I noticed from David Price in his last start was his velocity was up and his control was up. He was dotting the corners of the plate. He's got that breaking ball and that cutter, which come into a right-handed batter. But I think for me, and I think for him as well, that if he wants to be successful, he has to have that change up working. Everything can't be coming into the right-handed hitters. He needs to have something fading away, and that change up is going to be crucial for him tonight. Nick, are you, are you old enough to remember the show Happy Days? Yes, sir. Is this a shout out to the <laughs> fine? Come on, baby. Arthur Try you're a little Bella smooth today, Dave you know what I'm saying? Happy Come on, Fonz, right? You know what I'm saying? All right, I got you, that. Man. All right, welcome back with Lock and Wally. We're joined once again by Yahoo Sports NBA insider Chris Haynes. Let's move to the NBA, where yesterday Rajon Rondo spoke for the first time. Yeah. It's his brawl with Chris Paul, denying he spit at CP3 and adding, quote, everyone wants to believe Chris Paul is a good guy. They don't know he's a horrible teammate. 
They don't know how he treats people. One of Paul's old teammates, Clipper teammates, Big Baby Davis, agreed with Rondo on Instagram, writing, quote, I played with both of them. CP3 is a very bad teammate. But Rockets general manager Daryl Morey responded, tweeting a picture implying Rondo's comments were the pot calling the kettle black. Mm. I'm, I'm, mm. As someone, I, I'm a little bit confused here because mm. all these guys chirping can't be wrong. Right, I right. think Chris Paul is different. And I think, but, but, but some of it could just be he's about business and not everybody in the NBA is about business. Mm. And so that may cause him to clash with guys who don't take the game as seriously and the business of basketball as seriously as he does. I, I, I'm reluctant to pick a side. I, I'm, you reluctant? Get off the <laughs> fist and earn your money. <laughs> earn your money. Because <laughs> uh, what? I'm someone that people are like, oh, man, he's a jerk, he's a jerk, he's a jerk. And I'm just a teddy bear, man. And so I'm, <laughs> Chris Paul might be a teddy bear, man, and these guys just too soft. Well, let's learn something from the great philosopher Snoop Dogg. With so much drama in the LBC. <laughs> it's kind of hard being a homie CP3, but uh, here's the thing about Chris Paul, and he's not the only one guilty of this. I will defend him even better than Daryl Morey will. Uh, he's a barker. Now, he's not the only barker in the NBA. Kobe Bryant was a barker. And no one liked playing with Kobe Bryant, but Kobe Bryant was a five-time champion that made you swallow your pride and take that barking and the bite that came with it. Here's Chris Paul. Chris Paul's a barker. But on that same team, when you say it's time to swallow my pride and just deal with this, oh, wait a minute, you ain't one jack. So you over here barking, and I don't see the bite. And that's where it comes from. I've been on teams before when we're all, like you said, it's about business, professionalism. You're saying all the right things. You sound like the Mamba mentality, except you ain't got the Mamba hardware. So that's when everybody, when they get to their safe distances, and everyone who said that he's not a good teammate, I like him. They're cool cats, but they also are safely away from Chris Paul when he was barking at them on the baseline. And now everybody wants to come back at him, and no one could come back at Kobe and others who bark but have the championships to go with it. Well, I'm going to have to quote the great Snoop philosopher myself. Oh, well, let's say, do this. And say that Marcel is a jock in my style. <laughs> because you took, you took the words right out of my mouth. Oh, nice. But that, that, that's the difference. Nice. Chris Paul is in the Kobe Bryant category as far as leadership qualities, and you can throw, even throw in Jimmy Butler for that matter. Mm. The only difference is the hardware. Yeah. That's a major difference. It is. That is a major Huge. difference. And plus, then you add in the simple fact that Chris Paul has that leadership style, but he's also a ball-dominant point guard. And I remember I said this about this a couple of days ago. He's a guy who controls the rock about 18, 19 seconds of the tw whole 24. Players get tired of that. <laughs> you know, that was one of the main reasons DeAndre Jordan wanted to leave and go to Dallas a couple years back in that free agent fiasco. So that, that's, that's the only difference. Look, and Rondo... He has leadership style tendencies like Chris Paul, but a difference th that I heard when I talked to multiple players about him is that he'll come on after practice, pat you on the back, tell you everything is good. We'll get it the next day. While Chris Paul may just tell you what you, what you don't want to hear and leave it at that <laughs> and then expect you to, to come back next day. Yeah, look, look, I play for a coach, Bill Parcells, a barker. And every single time when he was barking, you had to go, oh, yeah. That's Bill Parcells, the yeah. champion. So you just got to take those things. And it, it, it's a major difference maker when you have hardware. If I were drafted to the New England Patriots, I would be sitting up here right now, even before I was a free agent. I could have been on the bench. Two-time NFL Super Bowl champion, Marcel Swally. All of a sudden, everything I say, a little more punch to it, man. So that's the game. I I'm going to analogize Chris to a guy that I got a lot of respect for, close to Isaiah Thomas. Mm -hmm. and, and Isaiah came to the NBA with an NCAA title ring at Indiana. And Isaiah Thomas, if you really ultimate leader, ultimate hold you accountable guy. And I know Chris, I believe, has tried to model himself after Isaiah Thomas. But, but again, Isaiah went out and got those two rings. Got those. He took on Michael Jordan. He took on Larry Bird. He took on Magic Johnson. And so when he's out there barking and doing his thing, he's the little man that did it all. And maybe Chris needs to adjust his approach a little bit. Now, because, I mean, he's deep off into his career. No titles to show for it. Uh, but, but I think his intentions are good. Yes. And again, until I hear an NBA champion call him out, 
you know, that, that's when I'll take it most seriously. Mm -hmm. All right, stick around later in the show. We'll give you our approval ratings for Chris Paul and see how these latest comments affect the all-star point guard. But first, let's move to another of his old teammates, Blake Griffin, yeah. who has been a bit of a punching bag the last couple of seasons, but is actually off to a hot start this year in Detroit, scoring a career-high 50 points last night in a win over the Sixers. He even hit the game-winning and one free throw in overtime as the Pistons moved to 3-0 on the season. Uh, as impressed as I am, and this, uh -oh. it was impressive, uh -huh. as impressed as I but. am, but <laughs> this is the new NBA, uh -huh. and I want to see, again, everybody's scoring over 120 points, man. You go look at the scores last night, everybody's putting up numbers. I think we're going to have to get to the end of this season before we can evaluate what, because I think some guys may score 80 this year. I think with the extra possessions and the place of play and the, you only got 14 seconds after an offensive rebound, I think we're going to see guys put up huge numbers. And so I want some more perspective before I'm willing to beat on the desk and say, man, Blake, but the poster child is back. So you want perspective, huh? Yeah. You ready to beat on the, beat on the desk then right now? Because I got some perspective for you. You're talking oh. about a five-time All-Star Blake Griffin. You're talking about a four-time second-team All-NBA player Blake Griffin. Now let's carve up his career because it's two Blake Griffins. It's the one that's on the sideline because he's injured, missed 29% of his regular season games because of injury, or it's the guy who was top five in the NBA before these same injuries. So this is nothing new for Blake Griffin when he starts to get that momentum. And even Stan Van Gundy said this last week, what is stopping Blake Griffin from being a superstar? He said injuries, nothing else. Blake Griffin, look at these numbers, this is insane. Uh, since he came into the league, fourth in rebounding, second in scoring, first in assists for, for power forwards, 12th of all positions in scoring. Blake, when he can keep a healthy bill out there and play with this intensity, play with the 82-game schedule, and be on the court, not on the sidelines, is going to be a top player in this league always. Marcel, he doesn't play for the Clippers anymore. You ain't got to keep talking up <laughs> like that. <laughs> let it go. <laughs> let, it, let it go, Marcel. Man. But I, I'll tell you this. this. This is what Blake has going for himself. Obviously, it's a, it's a short, short track record right now. But LeBron is out of the East. Um, he, he has an offense that's built and centered around him for mm. the first time. Um, then you have to look at it. His game has evolved to the point where he's not just relying on his athleticism. I was in the car yeah. with my brother the yesterday, yesterday, and he showed me a clip of Blake Griffin sneaking a dunk on Joel Embiid in transition. Sneaking a dunk. When, when he last heard Blake Griffin <laughs> yeah, sneaking he, a dunk in? Yeah, he just, yeah. But, you know, that's what he's evolved to. But, look, it's only a – Three, four games. Oh, here you go. It's like dude been putting up numbers for years. Oh, he I has. Three he, games. he has. He has. But I want to see not only him elevate his own game, but elevate the team's game on his Three back. and oh. No, yeah, yeah. Three and just yeah. beat a decent Philly team. Get him. But, but my, 78 more games. I, I, he five three-pointers last night, I believe, as well. And, and, again, he's always been able to shoot. But, wow, five three-pointers. I, I, I want to – but uh, I just think all these extra possessions, I think we're going to look back – at Russell Westbrook's triple-double season. Mm. And, and that's going to have a little new perspective given this new NBA. And so, as it relates to, to Blake Griffin, I, I expect Kevin Durant this year to drop 80 on somebody. Mm. I expect him to go full Kobe and drop 80 the way the NBA... I expect Steph Curry perhaps to have a 70-point game. We're going to see that as we adjust to this new NBA where they've basically illegalized defense. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> Draymond Green said it. it. They've illegalized. It's bigger Getting than arrested. Nino. <laughs> Getting arrested. For it's bigger than Nino Brown, man. Yeah. Everybody yeah, going down. Uh, out of tears. I would say this. It's a new NBA, but Blake Griffin is the same OG, and he's the same dude that could score in that era and in this era. Uh, more possessions, I get it, uh, but guys are shooting the three ball. Blake Griffin doesn't listen to challenges without responding to them and making you eat your words. Think about it. Blake came in just dunking, just athletic. Yeah. Okay, guess what? Now I'm going to hit the elbow on you. Oh, okay, that's all you can do. You can't shoot outside the elbow in the painted area. Then he went to the 18-footer because the President Obama told him he couldn't hit the 18-footer. <laughs> then he went to the free throw line. People said, Blake Griffin, if you're so great, why you can't hit the free throw? Start uh -huh. hitting his free throws. <laughs> now you said he couldn't shoot the three ball. Uh -huh. Blake Griffin out there, five three-pointers made. Uh -huh. Y'all better respect greatness when y'all see it because it's happening right in front of your you face. You know what? I like your argument because... Blake Griffin's kind of been disrespected as kind of a studio gangster. Yes, and thank you. And he actually perhaps has more heart than we're giving him credit for. Now we're cooking. You get the criticism, now he adjusts. All right, welcome back. 
I'm Jason Whitlock. He's Marcellus Wiley. Mm -hmm. Time to put on our thinking caps. Mark Slareth is back, and we're joined now by Fox College football analyst Joel Klatt. As you all know, I'm a journalist, and we've got our resident Ivy Leaguer here, <laughs> Marcellus Wiley. Mm -hmm. So we're going to make we're going to take a deeper look at these some of the big issues in sports. And we've got a special cap for uh, Marcellus Darnell. Bring it out. Oh, huh? uh, our Columbia grad. Oh, thank you very much. Is that a Where'd polo you go or to Idaho? Oh, Idaho. It's why they call the, the blade. Colorado and Idaho. Right? Yes. Blade yeah. Yeah. Right, Colorado. Put the cap one so we can move on. Let's do this. All right, all right. Let's <laughs> let's move to the NFL. E. Where Raiders quarterback Derek Carr struggles and alleged crying on the field have shined a new light on his reportedly fractured relationship with his teammates, but to me. Car's emotions and poor play aren't the only things driving these issues. I would argue it's no coincidence that the devoutly religious car is having trouble getting along in the Bay Area with the Raiders' woke locker room, and the whole situation got me thinking that religion has become a more divisive issue in sports than it used to be. I, I think if you look at, particularly in football, if you look at the history of football, a lot of people viewed involvement in football, particularly coaches, that was kind of their ministry. That was how they worked with at-risk kids and gave back in their communities, any boys in their neighborhood that didn't have father figures, you'd get them on a football team. And again, football is for short people, it's for tall people, it's for fat people, skinny people, it's for everybody, rich kids, poor kids. And this was a part of their ministry. And so I've always, previously, football was a very welcoming environment for guys that we used to call on the God squad. They mm -hmm. got along with everybody. And I, I don't think that's the case anymore. And I think that uh, Derek Carr's devout religion and, and wearing it on his sleeves has put him at cross purposes or crossways, side, got him sideways with some of his teammates. And it, I, I could see this happening in more and more locker rooms. Yeah, very layered conversation. Uh, I will start and preface it by Performance is currency in the locker room. If you are balling, you are popular. If you are balling, you're funny. If you're balling, you're well-liked. <laughs> and if you're not, you could be Dave Chappelle in there and telling stand-up, and people are like, ah, uh, hi, dog. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's just in personality, yep. let alone religious beliefs, where the proper decorum and courtesy used to be, don't talk politics, don't talk religion. Even in the locker room, because, being frank, uh, it's not the, the cordial thing to do. But with social media and the intersection of beliefs, and now I know what you're thinking, even if I'm not engaged with you day to day, guess what happens? Hey, bro, you said that? <laughs> hey, bro, you think that? And, and it's just crazy, because when I played, there were guys on the team that I was cordial with, but I didn't like or dislike. It's just when I walked around them, I was like, all right, what's up? What's up? And that's it. And it wasn't beef. But now that guy has a platform that can now come and intercept my platform, and then all of a sudden, do we have polar beliefs? Do we have polarizing moments? And I think right now, Derek Carr is starting to witness that. Yeah, I, well, I don't, I mean, I'm not in that locker room, so I don't know. I held a Bible study at my house for six straight years as a man of the Denver Broncos, did it in Washington as well, invited everybody. If you'd like to come, that's great. If you don't want to come, that's your prerogative as well. I mean, so... That's don't, a different era, Right, Mark. but yeah, I understand that, but I just don't know that, again, I think the bigger point to this is the point that Marcellus is making. If you're playing well, then it, it doesn't matter if you're proselytizing in the <laughs> locker room or if you're not. It doesn't matter what you're doing. If you're playing well, you have that currency to you know, to, to coin your phrase. And I believe that. And if you're not playing well, I'm going to put guys, you on the spot. Though, okay, please do. I, I get the whole, if you're playing well, you're popular in the locker room. Mm -hmm. But locker rooms have changed because American society has changed. Sure. It, we're a more secular society. I understand And that. the tradition in football and in basically all sports, but it was most acute in football, there was a religious connection. There was, there are a lot of guys that got into coaching that mm -hmm. were saw this as their ministry and a way of performing their religious duty. You go, I mean, BYU and guys doing missionary work and all that, that's been a big tradition in sports that I think as the society has gotten more secular, that's being run out of 
football. See, I, I would disagree. And, and the only reason is because last year, the very outwardly faithful pay, uh, uh, Eagles won the Super Bowl. I mean, they, they wore it on their sleeves. You, you like know, Tim Tebow did and got run out of the league. He, they wore it that way. Somewhat. I mean, Doug Peterson has worn it on his sleeve. That locker room has worn it on their sleeve. Um, Nick Foles, uh, right? Nick Foles has done that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I know Nick Foles well. Uh, Carson Wentz is certainly in that. And again, performance is currency, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? I mean, right. they were a really good football team. Mark, the, the Denver Broncos yeah. teams you played on, they were great football teams. Sure. And performance, I do believe that there's only one universal language in any locker room and really any sport, success. If you're successful, you can do what you want to do, and people will, will go along with it. They might not like it, but the difference is, and I think this is what you're pointing to, the difference is if you're not performing and someone does have a problem with it, they no longer have to keep quiet about it. They can be outward. Hey, man, I don't like that guy, and here's why. And that's, I think, what, where you're headed with that, but I don't think that that's a modern issue. I think that that's more a performance issue. I, I will say, like, it, if, if you are... Like if you are a, a you're a Christian and you profess your Christianity, and you're in the locker room doing that, and I don't think anybody has a problem with that. The the issue that you get into is that if you don't perform well, then a coach or another player will say the problem is is that you're spending too much time with that, as opposed to spending the time doing the work playing football. Same thing is if you're a guy that goes out and parties. If you're a guy that goes out and parties and you show up and you play well. Nobody's got a problem with you. Mm -hmm. If you go out and party and all of a sudden you don't play well, dude, you got to change your lifestyle. Deion Sanders. That, that's, the, that's what ends up happening in a locker room. But done right. I mean, done right, it goes back to, to the book of Philippians. You know, make my joy complete by being a like mind, united in spirit. You know, consider uh, uh, to, to me, those are the things that you start looking at. Like, um, like consider others as better than yourself. I mean, that's that's to me team unity and done right. I, I think that that doesn't any, do anything but enhance your football team. I, I'm not going to hammer the Tebow point because he didn't perform well. I, so I'm going to try to go at this a different way. And Joel, this is why I wanted you on <laughs> this segment. Could Bill McCartney coach football the way that he did back at Colorado. Sure. Can he do it today? Sure. Wearing his religion on a sleeve the way that he did. Sure. I think Dabo Sweeney does that to yeah. some extent down at Clemson. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. there, yeah. there are guys that do it. There's no doubt about it. Um, uh, Bill McC that's a Dabo's a great one, but Bill McCartney was – a you leader to, of a religious to, movement. That's true, but that, that movement only started at the tail end of his career when he decided to step away from coaching in 1994 to actually head up the Promise Keepers and, and really take that movement forward. So, yes, Bill was outspoken, but he, only, he was only a leader of a movement at the end. So I don't want to be revisionist and think that he wow. was doing that from 1983 or 1984 all the way through 1994. Uh, Mike McIntyre at Colorado is a, fa a, a faith-based guy and professes his faith. There are a a lot of guys out there, a lot of guys. And Dabo Sweeney, I obviously bring up just because he's probably the most successful. Um, Urban Meyer has, has, you know, professed his faith and, and coaches accordingly. Almost every team that we've ever been a part of has a chapel. And sometimes the most influential guy outside of the coaching staff or the strength coach amongst the team is the chaplain. We've all been a part of that. Yep. We've seen that and, and the ear that he has. So, again, I – I do want to go back to when it comes to individual beef between players, mm -hmm. Mark and Marcellus are absolutely right. It's the currency of performance. And I go back to the old Nuclelouche line, you know, Bull Durham. We all know and love Bull Durham, right? When you got mold on your shower shoes, unless you're a 20-game winner in the show, then, then it can be colorful. But unless you're a 20-game winner, then it's just sloppy. Yeah. So guys don't like it when you have all this extracurricular stuff right. or you're professed to be this and that unless you're performing. Marcellus, I want to come at you. Yes. I want yes. to come at you because yes, I'm going to leave these guys out of it for right now. This is, this is where my concern comes from. And, and, and people will probably be upset when I say this, but it's like Tom Osborne, Father Tom Osborne. Part of his philosophy and part of the things that got him in trouble and dinged his image at the end of his career is because he took chances on guys of questionable character. And, and you can say it was all about winning. I don't think, I think winning was a part of it, but I also think it was a part of his religious philosophy. He's not giving up on anybody. And I've seen a lot of black guys 
come out of some tough situations that only football and a football coach would have them. One of my best friends, the only reason why he played at Ball State was because he got shot in a Burger King parking lot uh, and couldn't go to Michigan State because of that, blah, blah. Tough guy that did some silly things. At Ball. He's one of the best men that I know. Father, uh, provider, kids are doing great, blah, blah. But if you knew him back then, you'd be like, wow, Ball mm -hmm. State took that guy. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we're going to start losing some of that. W to me, when religion gets pushed out and, and people just don't understand, the, to me, the mission of football and sports, it's about helping young people overcome their shortcomings and develop into fully developed human beings, no matter how flawed they are at 16, 17, 18 years old. Well, you're talking about redemption, and obviously uh, religion certainly is an umbrella for redemption of the spirit and also from your circumstance, so you have to respect that. But in uh, a, a news cycle where we're talking about Chad Kelly and his trespassing and playing for the Denver Broncos, which is not out there being religious in scope, but still giving him a redemption. He's been cut option. now, too. And he's been cut, yeah. right, because they gave him a chance after yep. he was suspended from yeah, two schools right. and then from college. Like, he's been given chances even outside the scope of religion. So football will always find that talent, that talent and then say, let's give you this opportunity. Um, to, to every point, I think you said it in terms of this is an age-old conversation, uh, whether you talk about the responsibility of being someone who sticks out. Jackie Robinson, uh, everyone talks about him breaking the color barrier, but what underneath that layer is the responsibility of not just being the first black player in baseball, but being the first black good player in baseball. Because God knows if you're not good, there won't be a second black right. player. And just like the religious scope, no issue with that, unless it's affecting why you're here in the right. first place, now we have here, a problem. But here, here is, and, and just to bring it full circle on the religion thing, uh, I played for Joe Gibbs, who's one of the most regal people that I've ever been around. And, you know, coming from the scope of having won championships in the National Football League, and what set those teams apart was, if I go back to Philippians 2, chapter 3, do nothing out of selfish or empty ambitions, but with humility of mind, treat others as more important than yourself. That, to me, is the basis of religion following Jesus Christ. That's the basis of it is treating others is more important than yourself. And you want to have a great team? Be willing to sacrifice. It's not about, Joe Gibbs used to say this to us all the time, lose yourself. This is not about you, this is about us. What can you do to make us better? And if that's just honest, that's just the truth. That to me is far more important than talent. He used to say this too, great players will make plays in the first three quarters. Character men will win games in the fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. And I believe it to be true, and I've seen it in my own career, and I've seen it with three championship rings on my fingers because guys were willing to forget about themselves and work for a greater good. And that's a, the old era. And Eminem said it too, lose yourself. And guess what? <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't matter what era. See, I didn't even know yourself. Eminem said that. <laughs> no matter who you are. Thank you, Joel. Thank Wait you, Mark. The Eminem stole from Joe Gibbs. Coming up. And the Bible. <laughs> Whitlock and Marcellus Wiley. What up, baby? Time for my favorite segment, Antisocial. No, it ain't. It is. No, it ain't. I love it. Darnell tells me what's out there on them Twitter streets. I get my streets. Twitter off can. It's in them streets. What Darnell is Smith, <laughs> what's happening out there in social media land? It's a lot going on, man, but we're going to get straight into it with your best friend, <laughs> Sean King. That's my dog. Uh -oh. oh, man. <laughs> who, who used Chad Kelly's arrest oh, over man. the Rachel weekend. Rachel Dolezal back in the house, huh? Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am not. Oh, man. <laughs> is that Sean? No, no, yeah. no, no, no. <laughs> You see, I got <laughs> jokes for you. Come on, Marcelli. Stay clean. But hey, I got a clown. That did look like Sean. <laughs> Here, go ahead. All right. Yeah, so Sean, he used Chad Kelly's arrest over this weekend to bring up Colin Kaepernick. King ran it on Instagram that Kelly's multiple run-ins with the law in high school and college didn't stop him from getting drafted in the NFL or losing his job, while Kaepernick, who never had issues with the law, is still out of work. You guys mentioned earlier that Kelly got released by the Broncos. I think social media backlash had anything to do with this? Uh, Marcel, I'm going to let you go first because I got a whole different point. Uh, no, I don't think the backlash had anything to do with this. I think this is a guy who's a multiple offender, different levels, uh, and he's been given redemption opportunities in high school and college. And I'm sure the first conversation a, a John Elway has with him is like, 
We're taking a chance. Zero tolerance. And once you go out there and do something like that, uh, we want to get the facts. And then once we get the facts, you got to go. Simple. This is why I don't like Sean King and his impersonation of a black man over Twitter. This is a game we can't win. <laughs> Flat out. We cannot win this game. So if we play this card and this alleged pretending to be black man plays this card, this legalizes white people that don't like black people to start going, well, what about Tyreek Hill? What about Joe Mixon? What about, uh, what was the guy, the, the, the defensive end, that got the, the Cowboys, that's now the uh, Greg, Hardy. Greg Hardy? What about X, Y, what about Lawrence Phillips? What about, this is a game we can't win. This feels good for a moment over Twitter, but we lose this argument because football is 70% African American and the guys that are getting a lot of the second chances are us. This is a losing argument. This is why he's dangerous, and I wish we quit fooling around and pretending like this dude's black and speaks for us. Darnell, what's next? <laughs> All right, moving on to a Are lighter we say note. Something else after that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean Whitlock. I don't know what he is. I don't know one percent, twenty percent, fifty percent, hundred percent. You know, don't him let the page out fool him. Him and Elizabeth Warren. Uh, yeah, man, <laughs> gangsta. <laughs> Go ahead. Go All right, what? No, no. sticking with the NFL. Cam Newton led the Panthers back from a 17-0 deficit to beat the Eagles on Sunday, scoring 21 unanswered points in the fourth quarter, which earned him NFC Offensive Player of the Week honors, despite being 9-17 for 68 yards in the first three quarters. Pro football talk even threw some shade at him for achieving the honor in an uneven performance. Do y'all think Cam deserved this? Hell yeah, because mm -hmm. one quarter matters more than everything else in the NFL, and it's the fourth quarter, and Cam balled out and led him to an incredible victory against the Philadelphia Eagles. Of course he should be player of the week. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 pro football woke. Uh, as much <laughs> as I'm hearing always about, oh, you know how many comebacks this quarterback has? Drew Brees, Andrew Luck, Cam Newton. We always talk about the quarterback and the comeback where I always retort and say, why are you down in the first place? But you know what? There is a stat that is respected in sports. He went out there in the most important time of the game and gave them 21 unanswered, and they won that game. So respect to Cam Newton. Of course, he's a player of the week. Hats off to Cam. Darnell, what's next? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, moving on to the never-ending Jimmy Butler saga. Butler has been very vocal about wanting out of Minnesota and reportedly had beef with teammate Andrew Wiggins. But Wiggins just said, quote, me and Jimmy have always been cool. Even the first time I saw him at training camp, we talked, there was never a problem. People on social media made things bigger than what it is. Is it fair to blame social media for the Jimmy Butler drama? No. How, how do you, J Jimmy Butler started the drama. J Jimmy Butler went on the record with Rachel Nichols and did all that stuff at practice. And, you know, I, I get you going to blame Steven Jackson for the meme he put out? <laughs> you no know, oh, heart. I got no heart. No, I don't blame social media. I do, uh, because I think that in real life, I could give you a kernel, but you don't want to turn it into popcorn. And y'all start popping, 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 popping. I had a beef with Charles Barkley when we first got connected in the media world. Not beef, just difference of opinion. And then we squashed it quickly, privately. Dan Libertar, shout out to our boy, who made it happen. And, and, Social media kept going. I was like, dog, we cool. But that's how social media is. If we have a dispute, they're going to pop that kernel until it turns into something bigger than it really is. Respect. Look, uh, having a beef with Charles Barkley is like a rite of passage in the media. <laughs> <It really laughs> that, is. How it goes. That's how you become friends with Charles. You have a beef with him. <laughs> right, right. Uh, Respect. You... <laughs> All right, Darnell, what's next? <laughs> All right, last but not least, yesterday I was watching Lock It In, and our guy, Cousin Sal, had a very interesting point leading into the Rams and uh, Packers game coming up this Sunday about Aaron Rodgers. Uh, take a listen. Aaron Rodgers has never been a bigger underdog than he is on Sunday. Nine points. Ever. You, you know that, right, Rachel? Mm, you're I the one who told me that. But mm -hmm. the thing is, he's not even the best Aaron in this game. Like you said, Aaron Donald is going to give him a fit, and the Packers are going to lose. They're 2-7 and seven against the spread in their last nine against winning teams, 0-4 oh in their last four on the road. They're in trouble. Look, they didn't even score. They struggled against San Francisco, a team that the Rams put up 35 by accident against. I think <laughs> nine is a fair spread in this game. Mm. Do y'all agree with Cousin Sal? Aaron Donald better than Aaron Rodgers. I like it. Not yet. You don't, nah, Aaron. Come on, Marcel. Aaron, you a D-lineman? You, you got to respect tenure, too. That, that's what the greats say. When J.J. Watt was getting compared to Bruce Smith early in his career, I, uh, Bruce Smith, my boy, I hate to I let this out, but Bruce hit me back. He said, you got to do it for 10 plus. And what happened right after that? J.J. Watt kept getting hurt. Part of this. J.J. Watt's balling right now. And though. he's balling again, right? Yeah. But then it's a roller coaster where Bruce Smith was always. Aaron Donald's there. on his second contract. He got some, he got some years in this game. And, and he's still not a. Look, Aaron Rodgers, in terms of conversation, being greatest ever, and Aaron Donald, I don't think. Okay, that Aaron but Donald's right now, who's the better Aaron? Who would you? Oh, oh. 
Right Aaron now. Aaron Donald. Donald. There you go. <laughs> Aaron Donald. That's just because he had four sacks. Well, Call me at the Aaron Rodgers over five. Touchdown. That was Sal's point. Uh, and right now, Aaron Donald, better player than Aaron Rodgers. of the moment. Well, that's what I need to be. Well, it's a prison. Yeah, you got to be a prison. <laughs> All right, today we're talking about Chris Paul, who was called out by Ray yeah. John Rondo for being a bad teammate. Oh. Some of Paul's old teammates publicly agreed with Rondo as well. All right, I have Chris Paul rated at an all-star level yes. of 72, job performance 21, uh, 16 all-time greatness, uh, 22 authenticity. But, Marcel, I, I can't ignore all this noise around him. Why you can't? Because it's just tough. False accusations. It's, it's just tough. So, character, I got him kind of right in the middle of 13. I got to make up my mind. I got to see more evidence. What? So, I got him at a total of 72 all-star all -star level. A decade plus Ooh. of great Chris Paul, and then you hear three dudes on this team say, I ain't like that. Oh, it's been he chirping practice. for a long time. It has been chirping DeAndre for a long time. Jordan won the lead. Yeah, really? he came back, didn't he? <laughs> I take it all back. Okay, let me give you something of GOAT status, because that's what this guy is. Yes. Uh, uh, you yes. Go? He's a GOAT. Give him love. First of all, uh, our boy Charles Barkley said, uh, one of the best point guards ever, and definitely the best point guard of this generation. So, job performance, he's still playing at all-time level. 23? 23. Three, look, they were up 3-2 against Golden State. If he didn't get hurt, they advanced in that series. You forgot about that. And then let's talk about all-time greatness, which we just did. Uh, the dude is near the top. He needs that hardware. To whoa, 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 no? whoa. 23 all-time greatness? Yeah, yeah. He got no hardware. John uh, Stockton doesn't either. What are you going to say What are you gonna say now? And I wouldn't have him at a 23 what are you either. Say now? Really? So, so who's 25 for you? Whitlock, Magic, right? Magic, Point guard, 25, Magic, Magic yeah. yeah. All right, what's 24, Isaiah and them? Isaiah. Okay, Chris Paul is right under there, 23. Steph Curry. <laughs> what? Why are you laughing? Steph Curry got three. He got MVP. Steph Curry got championship rings. What are you talking about? I give you that, but Chris Paul, without the championship rings, if you just look at performance, does he not equal a Steph Curry? No? Not, not to you? To me? Hell yeah. no. Oh, okay, me either. Um, let's move <laughs> on. Uh, character, I ain't talking to you right now. This dude has tremendous character. One, he's the president of the Basketball Association. Two, he's a that great family. That means shady, but go ahead. He's a great family man. How dare you say that? And, and three, he took it's a punch from Rondo and actually still won the fight. If you watch it in slow-mo, whip players holding him back, he still won a fight. That uppercut and that straight right, how you win a fight after you got sucker punch like that and spit on? Respect to that character. Authenticity, he is who he is, man. Respect that guy. Um, he rides and rolls in the big circle, the greatest. We're running football. out of time. Or whatever. We got 15 seconds all left. Ghost and stash. I want to make this one more statement about union leader. My mother was all up in the union. You got to be shady to be in the union. That's messed My up. Mother. I was a player rep. <laughs> I was a player rep nine years. I wasn't shady. All right, that's it for us. Mama, I love you. I was just joking.